Okay, welcome back to school and uh, welcome to deep learning course. I'm so happy that and excited that you're here and uh, can't wait to learn about fascinating area of deep learning together. So I assume that that's not your first course in machine learning and I assume that you're exposed somehow with the concept of deep learning and neural network, but nevertheless, I start from the beginning with some sort of insight and definition of uh, deep network. So deep neural network is basically a hierarchical level of representation of data. That's basically what it is. It's important how to represent data, you know, and uh, if you have taken any course in machine learning, you're familiar with algorithms like PCA, for example. You have data and you apply PCA to it, you project the data in a new space. In this new space, you have a different representation of the data in lower dimensional space, say. But you may apply another uh, transformation or transform uh, on the uh, data and map it to higher dimension. The new representation of the data could be quite useful, depends on the task that you are doing. You know, you are doing classification, you are doing clustering, you are doing a given task. And this task is basically task of learning a function and for learning a function, you feed the function with some features and the way that you represent your data, features that you select or you create has uh, a very central role in learning that function. And neural network is basically, is a way to learn representation of data. Each layer of neural network is a new representation of data. And then we have a mechanism through which we can learn features and we can learn representation of the data which has to do with the uh, target task in hand. Uh, it's inspired by human brain or brain in general. So we have biological neurons and we have synopsis that in our brain that connect these neurons together. And this inspired researchers to make artificial uh, network of these neurons. So instead of biological neurons, we have artificial neuron, and then instead of synopsis, we have connection between these neurons in artificial neural network. And the function of biological neuron is quite different from the function of artificial neurons that we are using in, machine, in neural network at the moment, but that was the point of inspiration. So uh, I can say that uh, it goes back to 1958, actually even earlier than that, but the building block of existing neural network, which are perceptrons, uh, was suggested in 1958 as a model of neuron. That was a model of neuron that we, there was other model of neurons before this that we don't use it in neural network. But this was a model of neuron that we still use in neural network, and this is the bindling block. It is called perceptron, and perceptron is basically nothing except weighted sum of input. So if I have a three-dimensional vector, if I, if I have three measurements of an object, then perceptron basically would be a linear sum of these three. So it's going to be W2 times X1, W3 times X3, W4 times X4 plus W1. So it's just a linear function. And then a step function will be applied to this linear function. So this linear sum is going to be either negative or positive. And the step function will decide based on the sign that the output is going to be negative one or plus one. If this weighted sum is negative, it's going to be negative one. If it's positive, it's going to be 
uh, positive, and then I can use perceptron to classify two classes. If I have elephants and human being, and I want to show the picture to my model and ask the model, is it an elephant or a, 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 you know, human? If I have three measurements of these pictures, then I can feed it to neural network, and if these weights are correct weights, then it can classify two, two classes by outputting either one or negative one. <clears throat> and this building block actually has been used to form the most simple form of neural network, which is called feed-forward neural network. And feed-forward neural network is just collections of perceptrons, layers of perceptrons, and uh, perceptrons, you know, in, in which make a layer. In this case, for example, still I have a three-dimensional vector or three measurements, but they have also three perceptrons. This is one perceptron feed with this tree, and this is another perceptron, and this is another perceptron, and these two are perceptrons as well. So we have layers of perceptrons, and then learning this model means learning the, the appropriate weights here. <clears throat> and by the way, uh, if you have any question, you can interrupt me at any point. You don't need to wait until the end of the class. And instead of, in modern neural network, instead of just a step function, we have a more general function, which is called activation function. In this case, the activation function is a logistic function, but it could be many other type of activation function. And if we don't have this activation function, this is totally going to be a linear model. You know, this is like matrix multiplication. You can think of this layer as a matrix multiplication, three by three. And this is another matrix multiplication, three by two. If there is no activation function, it's going to be a three by three matrix times a three by two matrix, which is just a three by two matrix. It's a linear transformation. So this activation function makes the process nonlinear. Um, <clears throat> So it's quite a straightforward how it works. You know, we just learn some weights and then we have some inputs. The weights will be applied to this input and then uh, a, an activation function will apply to this and then it, it, it generate basically these numbers and then we have another set of weights for the second layer and then they will apply and they uh, make the output. If we have many of these layers, say for example, in a simple model of fit forward neural network, then we call it deep neural network. So deep neural network, the only difference is that it has many layers. And uh, in the past, like more than 20 years ago, we knew that if we make the model deep, it will generalize and learn better, but we didn't know how to do it. We didn't have any good optimization method to uh, basically optimize models when there are many layers. We'll learn about this. There's a phenomenon, it's called uh, vanishing gradient. The gradient vanishes in backpropagation algorithm and we were not able to learn that and when it, it was solved. And that was an important thing which contributed to the modern era of neural network. Okay, if you look at the trend interest over time to deep learning. This is basically uh, the, the trend based on Google trend. And you can see that in uh, 2001, this is the beginning of new era. 2006 was when the first paper in deep neural network, new uh, which was basically a Dip Boltzmann machine was published by Jeff Hinton. And then in 2000, uh, 11, 2012, AlexNet was proposed, a model which uh, had a very good performance on ImageNet, which is a huge data set with 1 million data points in 1,000 different classes, 1,000 objects in each class. 
It has a huge performance, better than any other model. And then it drew attentions. And then we see the rays of area of deep learning again. It was not always like this. You know, there was time that in uh, good conferences in machine learning, if you had a paper about deep learning, you know, the chance of rejection was quite high. The most frequent word of rejected paper in NURIPS, which was NIPS at that time, for two years in a row was neural and network. Uh, so that was the most frequent word in rejected paper for two years. So it was not always like this. I remember the time that the first paper in neural network in uh, deep network was published and that there was a panel in NURIPS and the title of panel was who is scared of non-convex optimization because all algorithms in machine learning was convex or convex at that time and if you are not able to convexify a model that was basically out you know people would say no, no it's not a convex model it means that forget about it uh, there was a resistant but it, it became dominant so uh, we have similar trend in machine learning, you know, they have a good correlation. I don't know the reason of some of this uh, <coughs> declines, but I know the reason for most of this raises that what happened in, in, in the literature papers or event that uh, led to uh, attention and get uh, attention. You, you see that, you know, even machine learning was not that popular at, that, at, at some time. I remember I was a PhD student and they had a paper in, uh, it was a conference in US. And I applied for a US visa and after a while, uh, embassy wrote to me that we need the paper, the, the complete paper that you want to present. And I told my supervisor, and my supervisor was quite surprised that the visa has nothing to do with the content of the paper. What's the reason? I explained to him that the, the reason is that I'm Iranian and uh, they want to make sure that this paper has nothing to do with nuclear weapon or, you know, <laughs> chemical weapon or that, so on. And the reaction of my supervisor was quite interesting. He said, okay, we are, we are, we are safe. Our work is good for nothing. And that was really, you know, machine learning at that time. It was quite theoretical. It was good for nothing in terms of applying this in the real world, you know. We had algorithm, quite complicated algorithm, theoretically, mathematically, with all type of solid mathematical proofs and consistency proof and convergence proof, but applied on 100 data set in low dimensional space. And if we were able to extend it to uh, 1000 data set, then we had another paper called X, X, uh, a scalable algorithm X. 1000 was scalable, you know, was quite different era. And, but now you use machine learning in, in everyday life. You had a question? Okay. Okay. Good explanation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's not biologically accurate, and there are many attempts to make neurons that are uh, more closely uh, mimic biological neurons. Spark neurons, for example. There are research in this area. There are networks built out of uh, spark neurons, for example. 
but uh, in terms of performance, I haven't seen any good performance out of those, those models yet. But it doesn't uh, represent a biological neuron closely, no. Okay, this room is quite hot, isn't it? Okay. Uh, yes, these are some milestones which can explain, you know, the raises in this trend. You know, in 2006 was the first paper by Jeff and in 2012 with Alex and as I explained, which had uh, great performance and ImageNet. And then in 2014 and 15, we had generative adversarial network uh, introducing generative models, which can generate, you know, images which look like human being and, you know, videos which look like uh, real videos and so on. Uh, AlphaGo in 2006 got a huge attention and news coverage, which was a model by Deep. Uh, mind that uh, managed to, uh, you know, win the game of Go, which is quite complicated Go because it has many states and won the competition and, you know, beat the world champion of Go. It had got quite attention. And in 2017, we had Transformer. Ordinary people don't know about Transformer. It didn't get ordinary people's attention. But that was the building block of models which got attention of ordinary people like GPT, for example, or BERT. And then in this area of 2020 to 2021, which was COVID, uh, many research related to health. Uh, deep learning contributed to many research. And in 2022, we had large language models and chat GPT that I'm sure you're all familiar with and most likely using that daily. Uh, okay. Just here actually in these two slides, I wanted to show you that the impact of deep learning in many works, you know, for like 20 years, there was no uh, improvement in speech recognition through any attempts of any algorithm. And then all of a sudden, deep learning made it happen to have a huge uh, performance in the speech recognition. And even now we have models that works better than uh, human accuracy. Uh, that was the ImageNet data set that I told you about. And it was a good contribution to the field because it became a benchmark for many algorithms in 2009. This data set was uh, produced. It's a 1 million data points, 1 million images of 1,000 subjects, like real images. So we have a classification with 1,000 classes. In each class, 1,000 uh, images. <clears throat> And you can see that in 2012, compared to 2011, we had a huge, uh, you know, increase in performance. In fact, you can see it in this slide better. That was 2011, and this was 2012, from 25.8, which was a state of the art in 2011. Uh, AlexNet performed 16.4 as the error rate. Uh, that was eight layers network. And then you can see uh, consequent years and you can see some sort of correlation between the number of layers of the model and the performance. The one with uh, 6.7 has 152 layers. So it seems that, not always, but it seems that the, the more layer, the better. You know, and uh, usually as a rule of thumb, if your model doesn't work in deep network, you have to add some more layers to it uh, <coughs> to, to, to work. <coughs> uh, I told you about this milestone in 2016, AlphaGo, and uh, in 
in 2017, it won the world champion in uh, Go and got lots of attention. Okay, I wanted to show you a couple of cool um, or interesting application as a motivation. If you take this course, you're motivated enough, but that might be interesting to see actually if So, how we can have the, how we can project the voice here, we, you can't hear that. What is the voice muted? Can you hear this? Okay, good. Uh, okay, let's look at this. Okay, uh, I just wanted to show you the, the concept that they can recover the sound based on <clears throat> video. No, I can't. I don't know why I can't go to presentation mode. Hmm? Okay, if you know how to do it, come. Yes. I just want to go to presentation mode and doesn't talk right. 
this one, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and here is another application that can explain all component of an object, you know, all segments, not just segments, you know. Like if you have elephant, for example, and it explain, you know, this is the leg, this is parts of... Um, this is also interesting to see that how Deep learning come up with a nice trick in an Atari game. The input to the model is just sensory data. What we observe on the screen is the input to the model. Uh, so this is after 120 minutes of training. But after a longer training, something interesting happened. I mean, it come up with a trick, which is really a smart trick. Okay. <clears throat> so there are many games that the level of performance of computer is better than human now, yes. It's uh, deep reinforcement learning. And that would be tentatively one of the topics that we are going to cover in this course, deep reinforcement learning. And deep reinforcement learning is basically reinforcement learning, except that we have a couple of functions, like value function, that we have to estimate, you know, given a state, what's the value. And they use deep network to do this estimation. Uh, in the past, you were not able to do this, you know. Now, you can basically take the image of your artery game as the input, as one state, and feed it to a convolutional neural network, for example. And convolutional neural network is a function which can take the whole image and represent a value. Or in the game of Go, you can do s the same thing. But before Deep Network, we didn't have such capable functions, a function with such capacity. Uh, so we couldn't, we were not able to handle, you know, these complicated states. But now we can do that. Other than that, it's just uh, reinforcement learning. Yes? Atari is kind of like a moving image, though. Is it, is it like still able to use convolutional? No, I just gave convolution for an example. I, I don't know if in this model they use convolutional neural network. Okay. Or it might be RNN, for example. I'm not sure uh, in this particular model what they have used. That was just an example that using neural network, you know, we can have functions to estimate states. We were not able to do that before. But it may not be convolution. It could be anything else. <clears throat> and you are you know about self-driving cars and this is also interesting let me show you this one try to do lip reading yourself to appreciate how hard it is to
Okay, and there are more examples. <clears throat> I told you that one of the milestones was generative models. And we had GAN, more recently we have uh, diffusion model, and we had GPT as generative model, generative model to generate images, to generate text, and uh, to generate videos, and so on. And uh, this is a GAN model. Check this web page. It's interesting. The web page called uh, uh, "This Person Does Not Exist." So. Can't just can't refresh this. I don't know why. What I see here is very different. Is um, and what I see in my screen is different from this. I cannot. I mean, if you just go to this page, this person does not exist. Each time that you refresh the page, you see a new image which looks like a real person. It doesn't exist. You know, it's generated by GAN. Okay, there are books written by generative models. This book is written by ChatGPT. You can see that it's on Amazon. The co-author is ChatGPT, and the illustrator of the book is Midjourney, which is something similar to uh, uh, stable diffusion, for example, which convert text to images. Uh, there. You know, for converting text to images, this is something that I tried actually. This is two verses of Quran that uh, describe heaven, and I feed this to a text to image model to see how heaven looked like in the mind of this AI model, and this is how the heaven look like, you know, that uh, uh, what is it, this, this two verses, within gardens and springs, uh, bearing fine silk and bracket facing each other. Okay, <clears throat> this is another book written by uh, large language models. Actually, the, the first one was a very simple book for kids. This is a really great novel. You should read it. And uh, it's 95% written by large language models. It's not that, you know, they ask the large language model to read the whole novel. You know, they, they feed it with many information. But say, for example, a crime happened and newspapers want to report that this crime happened and someone died. And so the, the author of this book asked a large language model to write a report, uh, which looked like a report from a newspaper in year 2020, with the style of New York Times, for example, and then copied that part. You know, this part by part used language model, or there are parts that uh, the author wants to mimic a particular author, you know, says that, Marcus or, uh, you know, Borges, for example, reported a death of author like this, and then it, it writes something and asks a language model to mimic the style of Borges or Marcus. Uh, so it's interesting novel. <clears throat> I suggest that you read it, and the author says that only 5% of that is my work and 95% is large language models. Uh, I was checking and so this uh, statistics that uh, meet February, there are more than 200 ebooks written by ChatGPT or large language models in Amazon. 
many of them, of course, nonsense. And uh, people spamming, some, some people spamming Amazon with writing nonsense books and just put it in Amazon because you can publish your book there. And Amazon had to remove some of them. But there are some of the books that are in the list of bestsellers. Uh, interestingly, some of this nonsense books were in the list of uh, bestsellers because it, it drew attention that, you know, it's written by chat GPT. Nevertheless, it was nonsense. You know, people tend to buy it. Okay, so... Um, you know what machine learning is. I'm sure that you had courses before in machine learning. The main difference between machine learning is a branch of statistics. Main difference is that uh, in traditional statistics, in classical statistics, we have a limited amount of data. In machine learning, you have too, many, too much data, too many. And uh, in classical statistics, we want to infer information from limited amount of data. There is a, just a pool, and I want to know what's going to happen in the future, in an election. But I don't have, I have access only to 1,000 voters. Uh, what's the behavior of population based on the sample? That's classical problem. This is it. In machine learning, the problem is reversed. You know, I have two, I have the huge amount of data, the whole internet, all of this text. How can I infer some sort of structures? understand this structure, you know, behavior of this images, text, and so on. And uh, again, I'm sure that you know that machine learning has supervised learning, has unsupervised learning, has, has reinforcement learning. I assume you know all about this and I don't repeat. If you don't, just let me know and I explain more. Uh, there are many other type of learning that you can hear about this online learning, you know, semi-supervised learning, and uh, uh, long-term learning and so on and so forth, zero-shot learning, few-shot learning. Uh, some of them are real concepts, some of them are buzzwords. Uh, still, I tend to stick to this classical way of categorizing algorithms in machine learning with supervised and unsupervised. And I believe most of these new terms can be categorized in one of these two or somewhere in between. We don't need that many words. You know, it's more clean to assume that we have supervised and unsupervised. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there are four fundamental problems in machine learning. There are many problems, but four fundamental problems in machine learning that we are trying to solve. There are classification, regression, clustering, and feature extraction or uh, basically representational learning. And very quickly in classification, we have this sort of data. When X comes from a D-dimensional space, so we have D measurements about an object. And we would like to predict Y when Y comes from a finite set, set of negative one and plus one for elephant and human being or set of uh, a finite number, 1,000 for ImageNet, 1,000 classes. And then the task is to learn a function f of x when feeds x to this function. So we represent our understanding of the word with a d-dimensional vector x. This image should be a d-dimensional vector x. This sound, this text, this uh, gene, this x-ray should be a d-dimensional vector x at the end. And then I feed it to f, and it generates y, and y should come from a finite set. This is classification problem. <clears throat> In regression, you just relax this assumption that y comes from a, a, a finite set. So y comes from r. It could take any value r. And that's regression. That's the difference between classification and um, regression. And in clustering, we don't have y in our training set. We just have x's. We never see labels of these points. We just have some d-dimensional vectors. Still, I want to learn a function f such that f generates some sort of y 
that y is similar when x's are similar. That's cluster. So in all of these tasks and in all of more sophisticated tasks that we have in machine learning, there is a common procedure. And this common procedure has three steps. In the first step, we have a model. This model will form a hypothesis class. And then we have a score criterion, which tell us that in this hypothesis class, which member is better than the other one. And then we have a search strategy, which tell us how to find the one with higher score. Okay, starting, it's uh, not working here actually, you know, very simple example, you know, given some data, I have some points. And I want to do regression, for example, one of the fundamental tasks in machine learning. I, first, I have to choose a hypothesis class. And my hypothesis class could be the class of all linear models. Okay? So it could be this one, could be this, could be this, could be this, could be this. So uh, the class of all linear models are infinitely many members in this hypothesis class. So this is the first step. The second step is a score criterion. Among all this many, num many elements of this hypothesis class, which one is better than the other one? I have to choose a criterion. I may choose to prefer a member which minimize the L2 norm, Fermi's norm, L1 norm. I would say that I will prefer a line such that observation minus prediction squared is minimum. This is my uh, scoring criteria. In instead of this, I may choose the one which minimize L1 norm. I may choose the one which minimize hinge loss norm. You know, and, and it makes basically, you know, the outcome completely different, you know. This is the difference between logistic regression and support vector machine, for example. They have different scoring functions. Uh, <clears throat> and then search strategy, which is basically optimization. You know, I know the class, hypothesis class. I know the scoring criterion. How to find it, you know? Okay, there are infinitely many of them. How can I find the one which minimize this scoring? Minimize this cost function and maximize the scoring. That's uh, where optimization comes to play. And... Uh, so I would say that any machine learning algorithm has these three steps, including what we are doing in deep learning. In deep learning, we are learning about new hypothesis classes. Perceptron, fit forward, convolution, RNN, transformer. These are all just different type of hypothesis class. And then a score criterion is more less the same as a score criterion in any other area of machine learning. And then we have a search strategy, which I believe we are quite uh, weak in this part. In deep learning, the only thing that we can do is back propagation and uh, stochastic gradient descent or variant of stochastic gradient descent. That's mainly what we do for optimization. And they are quite evident that many um, shortcoming in the area of neural network comes from this part that we don't have a good strategy of search. You know, you have huge, just a moment, you have like 
many of the models are quite large, quite large. And then you want to train a small model to have the same performance and you can't. You know, you start training and you cannot. And there are areas in machine learning, in deep learning, to get around this and training this small model, like knowledge distillation, for example. Knowledge distillation assumes that you have a huge model, it's the teacher, and that you have a small model, it's a student, and you have to somehow distill the knowledge of this teacher to this student, and then at the end of the day, this student performs not as good as the teacher, but close. But the, the, the point is that if you don't have the teacher and you have the small model and you start to train from scratch, you can't get to that level of performance. What does it mean conceptually? It means that I don't know how to optimize, right? Because there exists, when I have the teacher and the student, a pre-trained teacher, I can come up with a set of weights that with this set of weights, my small model works decently. But without teacher, I'm not able to come up with this set of weights. You know, I do gradient, descent, I do uh, back propagation and stochastic gradient descent. I don't come up with those weights because there's Non-convex, I go to a local minimum, which is not a good local minimum. And this teacher helps me to go to a better local minimum. So it means that there's something wrong with my optimization, you know. And this knowledge distillation, which is a huge, huge literature now, is just uh, a back door, you know, some way, a, a detour to, to get around this optimization problem, that's just an example. There are many of them, many of them in the literature of deep learning, which I believe contribute to the fact that we don't know how to do good uh, search. We don't know how to optimize well. It's a complicated problem. It's a highly non-convex problem, and there a little that we can do. This is a very good area of research, I believe. <clears throat> yes. Well, if you replace this perceptron by something else, still I believe you're going to have a very non-convex problem. And then the problem doesn't inherit from using perceptron. Uh, any, any other model which you come up with likely is not going to be a convex optimization problem. It's going to be a very non highly non-convex problem in very high dimensional space. And it's hard. To optimize. Yes. Kind of a similar question. Well, there's this concept of like the lost landscape, which is what your like your your loss function is kind of trying to trace a path towards this um, absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and you have some models that have better lost landscape than another. Um, you get like sharp peaks, which is a bit smoother surface. Um, yeah. And is that not inherent to the structure or the architecture of this model, or is it in the search? Uh, could be, you know, you can make improvement in any of these three areas, you know. Changing the scoring criterion definitely change the landscape. Changing the model definitely change the landscape. But uh, we are trying many different models. We are trying many different scoring. But we can we don't try many different things here. Not because we are not aware of, because we don't know how to do it. That, that's my point, basically, you know. Yeah, definitely you may come up with a model which has a better landscape or a scoring which has a better landscape. But if you, if you don't have such a nice landscape, then this is the bottleneck, and we don't know how to get around this. Yeah, the, the hypothesis class could be many different things, and neural network is just uh, one of these hypothesis classes. And here, just I wanted to explain this slide, that the score criterion or score criteria is, could be different forms, you know. It's the main difference between logistic regression, for example, and SVM is they have different score. 
uh, criterion. And the hypothesis class could be different models. <clears throat> this is funny. OK. So these are the tentative topics that we are going to cover in this course. Uh, we start with very simple model of fit forward. In fact, we start with, uh, with, with perceptron. We learn exactly and deeply how to optimize perceptron. These are simple. We don't use perceptron in real world, but it's quite important to understand building blocks and mathematics behind neural network deeply. Unfortunately, we don't know much about mathematics behind neural network, you know. We have, uh, we, we invented uh, the, uh, like, steam machine, but we don't have thermodynamic yet. We have models that works, but we don't know why, you know. There are, uh, you know, this field of uh, mm, statistical machine learning, which is a very theoretical field. Many models in deep network, in many cases, violate our knowledge in statistical machine learning, you know. I mean, theoretically, it shouldn't generalize, but it does generalize. We don't know why. So that's also a very interesting area for research. But uh, as far as we know, we try to be precise about the optimization and regularization and math behind these models. So we start from perceptron. We learn about small, I mean, old models like fit forward and convolutional network and recurrent neural network. That's basically the models that we had in the past before new era of deep learning. But then we learn about new era like uh, sequence to sequence models and moment matching networks and GANs, and uh, then attention, self-attention and transformers, and uh, more efficient versions of transformers like performers, and then BERT and GPT, and uh, variational autoencoders. Uh, if we have time, most likely we're going to have two lectures in deep reinforcement learning and lecture on graph neural network and diffusion models as well. Uh, there's no required textbook for this course, but this book is recommended and it's online. You can look at the book. Many of the new materials are not in this book, like diffusion model or transformers or this type of the GPT and bear there. It's not in the book. But still, it's a pretty good book for fundamental. Uh, how we evaluate the course. For course evaluation, we have two data challenges, which I explain what data challenges are, each for 20%. And then we have paper presentation for 10%. And we have final project, which is 50%. Data challenges are Kaggle competition. And uh, I think you're familiar with Kaggle, right? So we design in-class Kaggle. And this term in-class Kaggle is confusing. Some students think that it's going to happen during the class. No, it's, I mean, Kaggle has different categories like playground and di different terms. And one category is in-class. In-class means that that's for a class. It's for a private group. It's not public for everyone to join the competition. So we de design a private competition for our class. Uh, it's on two of them. And then we have to basically solve the problem and submit the result to Kaggle. And I will explain how it's going to be marked. It's going to be marked based on the score that you have in the leaderboard of the data challenge. And based on some minimum threshold and uh, maximum threshold. Basically, above some threshold, you're going to get the full mark. Below some threshold, you're going to get 
zero and between these two the score will be linearly distributed. And then we have paper presentation, which is group presentation based on the size of the class. We're going to have groups of two. So the, the first one was individual task, and the second one is a group task. So group of two, you're going to choose a paper. The details is on the web page. You know, there are a list of conferences that they can choose paper from. It should be a recent paper, and paper should be related to deep learning. But you can choose from the list of conferences that I listed in the web page, recent paper from this year or last year. And then at the end of the course, we have a couple of sessions that you present the paper that uh, you read for the class. And this is 10% of your final mark. And there will be some peer reviews from other audience. Uh, so when you present, your classmates will review and basically, you know, score your presentation. And I do as well. And uh, let me tell you right now that attending paper presentation is mandatory. I mean, coming to class is not mandatory, but attending paper because based on my experience, as soon as paper presentation start, many people start to. <laughs> not showing up. So paper presentation is mandatory in this course. And then you have final project, which is group project. Again, again, the details is in the web page. You form a group and you do uh, a project for this course, which is 50%. Uh, the details of data challenges in the web page, how to join the Kaggle, how to make an account, how to choose your name for the leaderboard, read those uh, um, carefully. Uh, it's important, you know, because otherwise, you know, it makes confusion. If you choose a name which is not based on the recommendation that we have in the web page, then it would be hard to match your name on the leaderboard with your identity and then uh, get confused or you choose other type for submission as well. As I said, the, the way that we score the data challenge is based on minimum threshold and maximum threshold. And uh, when we release a data challenge, we announce the minimum threshold, so, but we don't announce the maximum threshold. So the, the, we say that the minimum threshold is this, means if you have less than this performance, then you don't get any score, or any mark. We don't announce a maximum threshold to keep the uh, spread of competition alive, you know, people can make the model better, make it better. But there is a maximum threshold that above this, say if it's 90%, above 90%, everyone get the, for example, that's just an example, 90%, get full mark. And say below 60%, get zero. And between 60 and 90, the, the mark will be linearly distributed. Uh, the paper presentation, as I said, is 10%. Check the list of conferences that you can choose from. The final project is 50%, and the final project uh, has uh, basically has two types. You know, it's. Uh, It has two parts, a report, which is 45%, and a, a poster presentation, which is 5%. Poster presentation is quite informal. Usually the last class, the last lecture, we uh, make it for poster presentation. It's not a formal presentation. You know, it could be just standard poster. It could be just printout of your slides. It could be just whiteboard, you know, just a way to convey your idea and discuss your idea of the presentation to others. And at that time, you don't have the full result because it's still, you know, you're working on the project, but I assume that by that time you have some preliminary result and the solid idea of uh, work that you have done. So it's just 
for everyone to understand other people in the class what they did uh, <clears throat> we have two type of projects exploring novel idea I mean when you want to choose a project you can have two type of projects either exploring a novel idea or applying existing algorithm basically you can come up with a new algorithm exploring new idea new search strategy new optimization something new something idea which is novel and in this case I know <clears throat> many people avoid this because success is not guaranteed in this path you know you have an idea you think it's gonna be the best algorithm and you implement it you go through the math you you know finish the implementation and test it and turn out that the worst algorithm ever it doesn't matter in terms of your mark and final project, as long as you have done something sensible, you had a sensible idea, you had logical steps toward this sensible idea, your math makes sense, your implementation is challenging enough. When these steps are logical and make sense, in terms of novelty, in terms of effort, in terms of soundness of the approach, then don't worry about the the result, you know, even if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Okay. So approach is important. So basically I want to encourage you to explore <clears throat> new ideas and don't be scared of not getting the result. Another type of uh, project would be uh, applying existing algorithm. So you have a problem you don't come up with a new algorithm. There's many algorithms around and <coughs> you're gonna use them to solve this pro a, a particular problem. This could be another <coughs> type of project which is uh, completely <coughs> uh, good in terms of project, but the point is you have to be careful that uh, in this path, your project is not trivial, you know, because it could be a trivial problem. You know, I'm going to use a convolutional neural network, which is existing algorithm to solve digit recognition in MNEST. This is not a final project for this course. Right? There should be some innovation involved, some challenge involved, you know. Yeah, you're not coming with a new algorithm. But to solve the, the, the solution of this problem is not trivial. It, it needs some effort, it needs some innovation in, you know, structure the, 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 the existing algorithm in pre-processing, in something, you know, challenging. Challenge in, in implementation, it's not a, an algorithm that exists on GitHub and that I just take it from GitHub and apply it to this data and it's the result done. No, that's not a good uh, final project. All, <clears throat> all deadlines are on the web page, but these are two important deadlines that by October 22nd form your group for final projects and there are ways to register your group in uh, the web page. And uh, the report, the final report, I, I told you about the poster presentation. This is usually the last class. May, we may need additional session, but usually it's the last class. And the final project report due is December 20th. <coughs> and uh, again, all details are in the web page, but the uh, report length is maximum eight pages and make sure that it's like 12 point found and single column format it's not double column it's not uh, and make sure that you cite relevant works the I mean appreciate the works of others that you have built up in them um, I told you about poster presentation it's not formal you know um, it, it doesn't need that all people in the group present in, during the poster presentation. 
one person would be enough. It's well, I, it, I mean, if you prefer all of you be involved in the presentation, that's fine. But what we want to know is that what you have done in your group. One person would be sufficient. If you prefer all of you be involved, that's fine. Um, that's how we um, mark the final project. As you can see, the idea and the methodology, and the innovation is quite important. If there is ambiguity about this, again, look at the web page, explain what I mean by each of these items. Uh, we do communication through Piazza, not email, not LAIR, D2L. All communication goes through Piazza. And uh, except like uh, a personal matter that you don't want to use Piazza for. Um, there are a couple of topics that I cover in another course, classification. Is there anyone who is taking classification as well as this course? Just be aware that there are a couple of topics because you can't have a course on classification without talking about a convolutional neural network, for example, now. So there are a couple of topics, and these are topics. We're talking about convolutional neural network, feed forward, and perceptual and regularization in classification course. So be aware that a couple of topics or a couple of lectures that uh, are, are pretty similar in these two courses. <clears throat> uh, OK. So let me tell you a very quick history and then end this session. Next session, we'll start with uh, the you know, perceptron and then fit forward. So I told you that fit forward is basically layers of perceptron. And uh, the first attempt to model neurons was in 1943 when we had a type of, a model of neuron in 1943. And this model of neuron in 1943 was not perceptron. It was more similar to logical gates. So it was like and or not and so on. So uh, <clears throat> we are not using those now in neural network. So the first attempt in 1943 was not the attempt that led to neural network. The one which led to neural network was another attempt, 1958, perceptron, which I told you what perceptron is. And uh, they were quite excited about perceptron at, at the time, even though at the beginning they didn't know how to learn the weights properly. But they were so excited, you know. This is an interview in 1958. Claim is that soon perceptron can walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, be conscious of its existence. So general AI, you know, they, they believe that general AI is in their hand by perceptron. That was the dream. And the dream shattered soon. You know, there were some attempts later on in 1960 when people tried to do the optimization, but they learned how to, how we can learn weights. But the dream shatters in 1969, actually, when a book called Perceptron was published. And the book shows that Perceptron is nothing except a linear model. So if the model is not linearly separable, you can't do it by perceptron. This was not interestingly, you know, this is trivial to us now, but it was not clear to researchers at the time, you know, that they were so excited that this machine can do classification. It was not clear to them that it's just a linear model, you know, and they showed in this book that if you have X or problem, you can't do it by perceptron because it's nonlinear classification problem. Uh, later on, there was advancement in optimization and their advancement in the structure, you know. People start to solve this XOR problem by putting some perceptrons together. 
but adding perceptrons to together make the optimization quite difficult. And they had to come up with a better way of optimization, and that was uh, the path that led to backpropagation. There are many people who claim that we invented backpropagation. It's almost any important name in deep learning, they claim that I invented backpropagation. And in some sense, they're right, you know, because there were maybe the name was not backpropagation, but the idea of, you know, recursively finding the uh, gradient was in many different works. Uh, which we still use, the mature form of that. <clears throat> um, so I would say that in 1974, backpropagation is reinvented. I said, not, not, I didn't say invented, so because it was in some works before that, that we can, the idea of recursively using uh, gradient. So, about 1980 was the end of neural network and we entered the area that as I told you the most frequent word in the title of top conference is machine learning rejected papers were neural network there was many reasons for that <clears throat> one reason was that um, we didn't know how to make the networks deeper backpropagation it's not working, or with, with, with the form that we had at that time didn't work because of um, vanishing gradient. And there are not that many interesting problems that you can solve with a small network. The other one was data. We didn't have large data at that time. And the third one was hardware. We didn't have good computers for uh, hard optimization problem. So in, in a sense, in terms of hardware, it was, at the algorithm was ahead of hardware. You know, we didn't have right hardware. We didn't have GPU at that time, for example, to solve this. And uh, <clears throat> backpropagation and non-convexity actually was a great problem. You know, we can't solve deep networks. And it's non-convex, we get stuck in local minima. It's still, it's non-convex, but magically the problem solved because we are working in very high dimensional space and you can show mathematically that in high dimensional space there are many uh, good local minima. It's not true in low dimensional space. And at that time, we were working in low-dimensional space, you know, data was three-dimensional, four-dimensional, and the chance of getting stuck in a very bad local minima was quite high. And then we had, there was competitors, like competitors like support vector machine. Support vector machine was convex, very well-funded mathematically, you know, very deep mathematics and optimization behind it, very, very solid in terms of theory, and in practice it could beat neural network at that time. So why I have to pay attention to neural network? That's what happened in 1980, that uh, people start to lose interest of neural network, and for about 20-something uh, years, like 30 years, uh, it was not attractive at all until 2006, the first paper in deep learning was published, and then in 2012, that AlexNet drew attention and people start to think of neural network as an uh, important model. So that was a very quick history of neural network up to day, and then hopefully next week, Tuesday, we start the actual material of the course, yes. Well, it, it, uh, you know, 
it depends on, it's not a question about perceptron, it's a question about data representation. You have an image, how do you want to present this image to perceptron, you know? You want to just stack uh, all columns, pixels together, you want to apply Fourier transform to it and then apply the output of Fourier transform to perceptron. Uh, I don't know, you want to, uh, you, you can do any type of pre-processing to data and come up with a representation. In fact, in machine learning, before deep learning, you know, pre-processing was a big issue and problem. How can I pre-processing the data. The, the concept of end-to-end -end models is concept of deep network that don't do pre-processing, just feed your data, get the output. And all pre-processing happens in layers of neural network. But uh, mainly this is not a question about perceptron. It's a question about how you present your data to perceptron. Okay. Yes, it's a, like fully connected. Yeah. So my question is that if it considers group of special information, not all pixels, mm -hmm. why CNS, what better? Why is CNS looking for a local pattern? But local is better. Sparsity is better than dense. You know, when we teach, when we talk about convolutional net, neural network, we, we, we talk about this, that why locality is better, why sparsity is better. Yeah. In fact, there is uh, um, a rule, say, it's called bet on sparsity. That by, by hasty. Uh, bet on sparsity basically is a recommendation that if you can make your model sparse, make it sparse. It works better, always including neural network, you know. Yes, yes. Can we do final project alone? Uh, the is that can we do final project alone? Yes, you can. I encourage you to work as a group, but if you prefer to do it individually, you can. Okay, have a good weekend.